Hey, I'm Sean Barber. I'm one of the spine surgeons here at Methodist Hospital. Uh, I have an interest in spine tumor surgery, so I'm going to be talking today about intramedullary spinal cord tumors. So spine tumors can occur in a lot of different locations in the spine. Actually, the most common location is extradural or epidural, and these can be metastases, which is most common, or primary spine tumors like chordomas or osteosarcomas and Metastases are the most common uh, of all spine tumors. This is about 60-70% are epidural. The next most common is uh, intradural extramedullary tumors, which are things like schwannomas or neurofibromas. So these are inside the dural membrane, the fecal sac, but outside of the actual parenchyma of the spinal cord. And these happen about 20-30% of the time. The least common is what we're talking about today is intramedullary spinal cord tumors. So these are rare about five to 10% of all spine tumors. And these are actually inside of the spinal cord parenchyma. So this uh, happens in about one in 100,000 individuals. The most common subtypes or pathologies, uh, ependymoma, at least in adults, is the most common. This is a WHO grade two tumor, so relatively low grade. Um, and 60% of all intramedullary tumors in adults will be ependymoma. This is different in children. Actually, astrocytoma is more common, um, but in adults, ependymoma is first. Astrocytoma is second most common. It's about 35% of cases. Uh, in adults, most of these are high grade, whereas in children, actually, most astrocytomas are low grade. But most of these tumors we're talking about are going to be sporadic tumors. They occur randomly uh, due to some mutation, but there are some familial syndromes like neurofibromatosis type 1, which can predispose you to these types of tumors, and people with NF1 are more predisposed to astrocytomas, intramedullary uh, astrocytomas. Uh, after these two, these are the, the two biggest, uh, everything else is uh, more rare. Hemangioblastoma is the most common of those. This is a vascular neoplasm, also often mostly sporadic, but can be seen in a condition called von Hippel-Lindau syndrome. Metastases, uh, we used to think were very rare in the spinal cord, but actually they do occur in about 1% to 2% of cases. And there's also uh, lipomas can happen inside the spinal cord. These are benign fatty growths, not really a true neoplasm. And then other very rare things like cavernoma or intramedullary lymphoma uh, are exceedingly rare. Whenever you're evaluating somebody you think has an intramedullary tumor, you should also strongly consider several other pathologies that are not tumor actually neurological conditions like transverse myelitis, uh, demyelination like multiple sclerosis, and also things like ischemic pathologies or, or vitamin deficiencies. So it's important to rule those out. Most people who have intramedullary spinal cord tumors you would think would be paralyzed or, or severely uh, or with neurological deficits, but actually the most common presentation is just pain. So axial pain at the location of the tumor, it's going to be back pain or neck pain typically worse at night, and we think this is due to distension of the dura by uh, the expansion of the spinal cord pushing on the dura. Um, they can also have sensory abnormalities, uh, numbness, tingling, or motor abnormalities, weakness, um, but uh, it's less common, and actually bladder bowel dysfunction uh, is relatively rare. It's typically seen very late stage for these tumors. So diagnosis, at least in modern times, is with MRI, typically. And one of the hallmark features is cord expansion. So the spinal cord actually looks bigger in the area of the tumor compared to normal spinal cord. And that's key to differentiating these from some other neurological condition, like uh, myelitis or demyelination, where the cord will not be expanded. Uh, these tumors can occur in different locations in the spinal cord. Um, for instance, ependymoma tends to be central whereas certain things like astrocytoma may be more peripheral. Uh, hemangioblastoma tends to be dorsal. Most of these tumors will enhance to variable uh, degree. Ependymomas typically enhance strongly. Astrocytoma, as you can see on the top left of those pictures, this is an astrocytoma, has some sort of wispy enhancement. The top right of those pictures is ependymoma, which is strongly enhancing. And on the bottom left, you can see a hemangioblastoma, which is more dorsal and also strongly enhancing. Many of these tumors will have variable degrees of syringomyelia. This is a fluid collection inside of the spinal cord or spinal cord edema, which we can see on T2 sequences like a, a STIR sequence. And they may also have a cystic component associated with them. Typically, 
astrocytoma and ependymoma can have these. So on the bottom right, this is a chart uh, from a paper that sort of walks through uh, distinguishing these different tumor subtypes on MRI, although it's impossible uh, to distinguish them with any certainty and pathology is always required before we can say for sure what a patient has. So. The surgery itself, as you can imagine, is somewhat um, risky. Uh, well, the spinal cord has to be opened, actually, to get inside of the spinal cord to take the tumor out, which is inherently um, you know, somewhat uh, nerve-wracking. So the first attempts at this were actually in the late 1800s, uh, and patients, some of them, unfortunately, died. And the first successful uh, resections were in the early 1900s, and these are a, a surgeon in Vienna and another surgeon in New York City. Um, the results at this time were still not very good, so most people were advocating for radiotherapy for these tumors. And it was only later, through the advent of um, several important pieces of technology, that the outcomes became better, and people actually started recommending resection for these tumors. So in the 1930s, James Greenwood, who was actually a neurosurgeon here at Houston Methodist Hospital, he developed bipolar cautery, which is uh, the use of a uh, two-pronged instrument to burn blood vessels, which is essential when you're inside the spinal cord uh, to be able to burn the exact spot you want and not hurt the rest of the spinal cord. Also, the operating microscope was, was around for some time, but it was only used for this purpose starting in the 70s. This was with Yasser Gill. Um, other important things, intraoperative ultrasound, which we use to make sure that we know where the tumor is. We're opening up the spinal cord in the correct location. That wasn't around really for this purpose until 1980. Um, other important things, the ultrasonic aspirator, uh, and even MRI. So you couldn't imagine these days diagnosing a tumor like this without MRI, but it was done with things like myelography or even angiography uh, some years before. Uh, another important thing today, um, intraoperative neuromonitoring is really essential for resection of these tumors, and motor evoked potentials weren't really around or used for this purpose until uh, even 30 years ago. So surgery uh, for these tumors, the outcomes are somewhat variable. And uh, this is a paper from 2008. You can see even, this is only 15 years ago, half of the patients with astrocytoma who underwent resection had some sort of neurological deterioration afterward, which is obviously not ideal. Um, and perioperative complications occurred in 12%, in which is relatively high. Uh, it was realized at this time and even long before that success of these types of surgeries relates uh, to the ability to establish a plane between the tumor and the surrounding spinal cord, which that itself also relates to what type of tumor it is, so the tumor pathology. So ependymoma, for instance, and hemangioplastoma tend to have uh, identifiable planes around the tumor between the normal spinal cord and the tumor, whereas things like astrocytoma do not necessarily, they're more infiltrative, so it's uh, difficult or maybe sometimes impossible to resect them completely. The surgery itself, this is a paper from James, uh, James Greenwood I mentioned in the 1930s, sort of developed a bipolar cautery. He had this publication with several drawings that kind of illustrate nicely what the basic steps are. So an incision is made in the back of the spinal cord. It's called a midline myelotomy. And this is done right in the center between the two dorsal columns to avoid any uh, you know, major morbidity. And the second plate shows uh, dissection, so trying to establish a plane around the tumor. Uh, the third one is cauterizing blood vessels that supply tumor, and these tend to come from the central canal. So you see him um, cauterizing those with the bipolar there, and then removing the tumor. There are several important uh, key things that need to be remembered when operating on these tumors. I think maybe the number one is just diagnosis. So you don't want to open up someone's spinal cord unless you're pretty sure there's a tumor in there. So one of these things relates to imaging we discussed earlier. If there's not cord expansion, if there's some other uh, strange history going on, then it might be worthwhile to work the patient up further with lumbar puncture, for instance, or neurology consult maybe, just to ensure that this is not uh, demyelination or something else uh, other than tumor. If you are operating on the tumor, um, blood pressure uh, is important. Spinal cord needs to be perfused adequately during the surgery, so we usually place an arterial line and keep mean arterial pressure above 80 or 85. Also, uh, we're using monitoring, as I mentioned, so total IV and aesthetic is important. Um, neuromonitoring, there's several types. 
One of the most recent to emerge is something called D-waves, which is uh, direct waves, which is sort of a subdural or epidural direct stimulation right above and below the spinal cord, which can be useful if you're not sure that your motor evoked potentials are accurate due to blood pressure or patient temperature or some other reason. These D-waves can sort of act as a secondary measure to ensure that uh, the spinal cord is okay. Um, when actually removing the bone to get to the tumor, there are various ways of doing this. I think the traditional way is laminectomy, just removing the bone uh, altogether. Laminoplasty is removing the bone and putting it back at the end. And there's some debate about whether one is better than another. Um, some people who have multi-level laminectomy for spinal tumor resection can develop post-laminectomy kyphosis or deformity afterwards. So there's some thought that instrumentation or laminoplasty might prevent this, but Actually, several studies have looked at this and it doesn't seem to be any difference between the two in terms of deformity, although the risk of CSF leak might be lower with laminoplasty. Uh, when making the incision in the spinal cord, the midline myelotomy, it's important to try to identify the midline accurately. Sometimes this can be difficult if the spinal cord is, uh, the anatomy is uh, abnormal due to expansion of the cord or something like that. So. There are certain ways, like there's a dorsal vein that typically runs down the midline. You can also look at the dorsal root entry zones on each side and sort of find the middle between them. And you can also stimulate the dorsal horns to identify left versus right to help find the midline. Pathology is very important. As I mentioned, some tumors, astrocytoma, uh, can't often be resected uh, totally. is often not a good plane, so it's important to get some tissue early get a frozen section and see what kind of tumor you're dealing with before you decide or, you know, uh, to push further uh, with dissection. When closing the dura, it can be done primarily, just closing the two pieces together or with duraplasty, which is where you sew in a patch. Often this is done uh, if there's some concern that the tumor could recur and this can sort of give the patient a little bit more room uh, for expansion of the cord before compression occurs. After these types of surgery, typically admit a patient to the ICU for neuromonitoring. Also to keep MAPS elevated, which I would probably do for several days if possible. And also we use IV steroids to decrease uh, edema in the spinal cord after this. So surgery is sort of the mainstay of treatment for these uh, types of tumors, but there is the option of radiotherapy. It's a bit controversial for low-grade lesions, like a uh, low-grade ependymoma, low-grade astrocytoma. Typically don't use radiotherapy if you had a gross total resection, but if there is some residual or if the tumor comes back, that's the time where you typically want to uh, use radiation. Um, and for high grade lesions, typically do use radiation because gross total resection is not common. Uh, so radiotherapy might be recommended. Chemotherapy is uh, not very well studied for these tumors, although some people have used temozolomide with mixed results, uh, particularly for astrocytoma. The outcomes uh, depend on the pathology. So ependymoma, if you get a gross total resection, outcomes are typically very good. A 10-year progression-free survival is uh, some 90%, whereas astrocytoma is more variable. This can be because uh, you have low-grade, high-grade tumors, and also variable degrees of resection. Typically, the outcomes are not quite as good for high-grade astrocytomas, for instance, particularly if not able to achieve gross total resection. Uh, that's all I have, short talk. Thank you for your time. I'm Sean Barber with the Neurological Institute at Houston Methodist Hospital.